Good morning, and welcome to the Saturday Morning Breakfast Bible Study with Pastor Lydia Spragan, pastor of the New Destiny Christian Methodist Episcopal Church located at 825 Lorenz Avenue in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 15220. Let us pray. Gracious Father, here we are. Center us in your word. Take away any distractions that we might concentrate and focus on what it is that you would have us to learn today. Send your Holy Spirit to teach us and to lead us into all truth. Help us to be good students of the Holy Spirit. Open our hearts, our minds, our ears, our eyes, and our souls to his very presence, that we might speak boldly on your behalf, and that our lives might be a witness to you of what we have learned. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Well, we are still in the the book of Ruth. And in the book of Ruth, we are learning how to do the character sum I mean sorry, the chapter summary method of Bible study. Now it has uh, several parts to it. And today we are on the third part, which is the character study or the chief people who are in the book of Ruth. Now, we're going to look at the book of Ruth as one big chapter, okay, one big scroll of what it is that we want to learn about the Bible and how to study it. And we're going to use Ruth because she only has four chapters in her book. And while I'm saying she and her, it is attributed to Samuel the prophet as the author. Now, the ultimate author, keep in mind, is God. The ultimate author of the book is God. Okay. So, as we look at the chief people, we want to make a list of the major individuals in the chapter, um, in our case, in the book of Ruth. Now, the chief people would be those people who show up most in the book. However, for our purposes today, we're going to call them the major characters and the minor characters. And I think I went over them last week, but let's start again. The major character in the book is Ruth. She's the title character in the book. But as I continued to study on the book of Ruth, I came to the understanding that perhaps Ruth is the title character. But is the book really about Ruth or is the book about the second major character, Naomi. It may be the book of Ruth, but it is the story of Naomi. The book of Ruth and the story of Naomi. Now, those are two of the major characters. The third major character in the book is Boaz. Boaz. B-O-A-Z. Now, we've read the story of Ruth in three or four or five different versions, depending on how much time you put forth into the actual study itself. I've read it in five different versions, okay? And that was the second thing that we were supposed to do, was to read the, the chapter or the book over and over again, up to five times before we actually started to study it. Why is that? 
because in our spirits, we begin to put the word of God. And if it is living in our spirits, it will live in our lives. Okay? So we want to read the word of God. Actually read the word of God. Now, when it gets inside of us, we don't have any trouble remembering what the word of God is all about. In the book of Ruth, we remember Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz. Those are the major characters. And then we have some minor characters, three of whom are dead. Three of whom are dead. You have Elimelech, Milan and Chilion. Elimelech, Milan, and Chilion. And you will see why they are important, even though they are deceased. Then we have one character that I spent a lot of time on last week called uh, Peloni Almoni. Peloni Almoni. P E L O N I. A-L-M-O-N-I. And those are two words. P-E-L-O-N-I is the first word. And A-L-M-O-N-I is the second word. Poloni Almoni. Well, you say, well, I read the book of Ruth five times, and I didn't see his name in there or her name in there anywhere. Absolutely. You are absolutely right. You were paying attention as you were reading. However, uh, Poloni Almoni basically means so-and-so. One of the unnamed characters in the book, he never gets a name in the book, and yet his character plays a role in the book. In fact, it's a very pivotal role in the book. His so-and-so name matches his... Listen, I, I did want the land, but I don't really want Ruth. Uh, because that might take away from my own family's inheritance. Uh, you can go on about it. I don't care. You go on about it. Let me take off my shoe and give it to you so you can go on about it. His, his attitude, his I don't care, laissez-faire, whatever you want to call it, attitude, uh, is his image and is his portrayal. And is his character. He's so and so. Uh, we don't really care about him. We don't care about his name. We don't care about anything he does except he's the one who makes the marriage of Boaz and Ruth possible. Okay? And then, of course, you have baby Obit. Now, he has no speaking role at all either and yet he brings a great deal of security and joy into Naomi's life okay so we've got the characters here but I missed one this character is silent his name is not mentioned at all but remember I told you that God is the author of all the books in the Bible. His hand is all over it. His 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 purpose, his plans are always being conducted. In the Old Testament, every single book is pointing toward Jesus the Christ. And then in the Gospels, we have his arrival, and then it points toward Revelation, which is the revelation of Jesus the Christ. Remember, the Bible is an unfolding book of Revelation. It 
starting with the book of Genesis. In the beginning, God. Who? God. God begins to unfold or reveal himself. In the beginning, God. And at the end, you have the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is a continuous spectrum of who God is to the revelation of Jesus the Christ. Now, so when we look at the book of Ruth, one of the first things that we're going to notice is God does not speak with a voice in this particular book. We don't see anywhere in it where God said. God didn't say anything. He's the hidden captain character. He's the one behind the scenes. He's the one that's, uh, if, if you will, controlling the, the, the complete, he's the director. That's the way. He's not only the producer, he's the director of what is going on in this narrative. And remember that Ruth is narrative literature. So we expect to get a story and we expect it to have some type of narrative form, story form, and we expect sometimes a narrator. And the person who is narrating this one is a silent narrator. His name is God. Now, we don't have him speaking, so he doesn't have a direct voice. He doesn't have an explicit presence in the book, okay? He's, he's not explicitly mentioned, but he has an implicit presence in the book. All the plans, all the purposes are wrapped around, entwined in, and a part of God's plan and God's purpose. So he's producing the story. He's directing the story. The characters are acting under God's direction. Now, God's influence, we have to look for it. Otherwise, we just might read just like a story like Goldilocks and Three Paths or any other narrative that we might read. Uh, however, when we look for God's presence in the book, we will surely find him. We will surely find him. He is hidden to those who are not seeking him. But those who are seeking him, he shall be found. And he shall be found in the book of Ruth. Now, let's look at how his, ever, his influence and his providence is affecting the book of Ruth. His divine presence. His uh Providence is looking out for Ruth and Naomi and even for Boaz. How does his providence show up in their lives? And see, that's sometimes what we have to do too. God is working behind the scenes in our life. We don't understand sometimes what's going on. We don't understand why it's going on. We don't understand how it's going on. We don't understand who is involved and why they are involved. But God is at work in our lives. God is at work. He has designed us for a purpose and for a plan. And whether we are up or whether we are down, whether we are in the valley or whether we are climbing up the mountainside, we can realize, if we take the time to do so, that God is at work. God is at work. He may be hidden. It may look like he doesn't show up at all. 
We may not hear his voice, but God is at work every single minute, every single second of our lives. How do we know that God is at work in our lives like this? In him we move and have our being. The very air that we breathe, that that breath, that pneuma, is God showing up in our lives on a regular basis. God is present with us. This is important in the book of Ruth that we realize this because the first verse says it was in the time of the judges. A very dark time. And yet it ends up with the legacy coming to of Obed being David the king. David the priest. David the prophet. David the lineage of Jesus the Christ. So we can see that God has a plan and God has a purpose here. He's 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 uh he's influencing the events. He's putting things together. And if we look at Ruth, the book, it's not only the story of Naomi, but the story of the un- continuing unfolding purpose of God from the book of Genesis to this book of Ruth, we begin to get perhaps a better or a different perspective on things. So what do we see about God in the book of Ruth? We see his hidden presence. Okay? We see his hidden presence. This apparent silence of God does not mean that God is absent. That's That says volumes to me. The apparent absence of God when everything is going wrong that could go wrong in my life, when I have reached my most difficult moments, when I'm walking in the valley, it may seem to me that God is not present. But it does not mean that God is not present or absent. It means that God is silent. God is still working in my life. And I have to remember that God is a keeper of his promises, that he's promised never to leave me nor forsake me. So even when I'm in the valley, even when it seems like he's not present, he is present. He is working. And he may be silent. Silently at work for my good and for my benefit. God is in control. God is sovereign. God is sovereign. So one of the things that we want to realize, and we may want to even write it down somewhere, I I write it in my Bible because this is a revelation to me. And what is the revelation? Even though I cannot hear his voice, even though God is not speaking, even though God is not speaking, God is still at work. God is still at work. That's number one. Number two, God may be silent, but not absent. from our lives, from our lives. Number three, 
look for and expect God's plans and purposes to continue in our stories. Okay. Even though God is not speaking, God is still at work. Number two, God may be silent but not absent from our lives. And number three, look for and expect God's plan and purposes to continue in our stories. Ruth's story is unfolding. Naomi's story is unfolding. Boaz's story is unfolding. And God's plan and purpose is unfolding to their destiny. And I might want to add, in our stories, to God's destiny for us. Yeah, yeah. So that that's the first thing. God's hidden presence means that God is working behind the scenes. Now, sometimes God is up front. You know, he's right up front, burning bushes. Uh, uh, pardon seas, but sometimes, sometimes, uh, Daniel in the lion's den, sometimes though, God is working behind the scenes. God is working behind the scenes. I might want to put that down as number four. God does not always have to be up front. Sometimes. All the time. God is working behind the scenes. Okay. The fact that God is not always up front and the fact that God is, is, is not always speaking, the fact that God is working behind the scenes, the fact that God is silent tells us that God's presence is always constant. God's presence is always constant. And we can not only know that God's presence is always constant, but we can be assured that God's plan is always at work. I think that's the last thing I want to write down here, number five. God's presence is always constant. And we, and we can be assured that his plan is at work. Okay. His plan is at work. Now, how do we know that he's present and that his plan is always at work? Number one, we can look at it 
through Ruth Faith. Ruth Faith. Ruth Faith. Ruth is a Moabite. Now, now remember, this is a Gentile woman who God has a plan for her life that involves leaving her own people, her own culture, her own background, getting married, her husband dying, her not having any children as of yet, and going with her mother-in-law. Now, that's a profound faith. Leave everything you have and go to a land that I will send you. Where's the last? Where, where's one other place in the Bible where we see that kind of faith? Is it not Abraham? When God says, leave this place and go to a land that I will show you. Okay. I, I will show you it. I will make you some promises there. I will have a covenant with you. If you leave this land and go where I send you, I make a covenant promise with you that X, Y, and Z is going to happen. So we look at the life of Abraham as a life of faith. By the same token, we can look at the life of Ruth as a life of faith. She's willing to leave all that she knows and basically step out on faith and go with her mother-in-law. She don't know what's going to happen. She's walking by faith and not by sight. So Ruth's faith is evidence that God is at work. Okay? Okay? Her famous declaration of faith, the one that if I ever get married, I'm going to have printed on my, my wedding invita invitations. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. And your God, my God. What a poignant, passionate faith Mo Ruth exhibits. She says, I'm going to leave the gods of Moab, believing in no way. I'm going to go with you and trust your God. I'm going to rely upon your God. I'm going to depend upon your God that everything and every step that I take, every step that I make in this direction is being led by him. I'm not only going to go with you, I'm going to go with my faith in this God that I have learned from you, that he is going to. He is directing my path, and I am going with God. Her faith extends beyond Naomi. Her faith extends beyond Naomi because she does what Naomi tells her to do, but she doesn't know this Boaz from a can of paint. And yet when Naomi tells her to go and basically uncover his feet and let you know let him know, you know, this is the I want to be your wife and blah 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 and Boaz gets up and says, My goodness, I I, I want to be your husband and whatever and goes out to the market. Her faith is that everything is going to work out all right. God got this. God got this. He's not going to leave me destitute. He is providing me with food. He is providing me with shelter. He is providing me with the means of work. 
He has provided me with a husband again. God is at work in my life. And his providence is evident enough in my life to sustain me. Even though the folk around me might be talking about me when I first got here because I'm more by this and I'm in a Jewish place and I stick out like a sore thumb. Everybody knows who I am. And so I'm not in a good way. She's the Moabitess. Can you imagine? She's the Moabitess. Not she is Ruth. She is the Moabitess. You know that Moabitess that Naomi brought back with her. And then God gives her favor. So look, God's provision is extending not only to his providence, but God's favor. God's favor. There is nothing better than to walk by faith accompanied not only by goodness and mercy, but accompanied by God's providence and God's favor. So we see God at work there. We see God's work not only in the providence of Ruth's life, but God's providential hand is at work in the characters' lives. It's at work. His divine protection, if you will. We'll call it providence, not only his provision, but his uh, protection. So we'll call We'll say providence. Is God's presence. God's provision. And God's protection. At work. at work. Okay. Uh, God does something else here. His protection is extended to Naomi and Ruth. Not only through the hand of Boaz and his workers, and the people who are gleaning in the field. God's protection is extending to the legacy of Naomi. He says, don't worry. Your husband may be gone. Your sons may be gone. Yo, yo. But I'm going to protect the lineage through which I have decided that I am going to bring the Messiah. When protected. In that, God shows the greatest love of all. Uh, Isaiah says, Sing, O barren woman. Give Naomi the opportunity to sing again. You thought I forgot about you. I ain't forget about you. I love you with a greater love than you will ever know. You too are walking by faith and not by sight, by going back to your homeland. You thought you were just coming because you'd be among your people or whatever. Now that your husband and your sons are gone. But I have a bigger plan. I have a bigger plan. And I am going to utilize you to protect the legacy and the lineage of Jesus the Christ. The legacy 
of his ancestors. And the lineage through which he was to come. is leading to the story. Now so much is for 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 foreshadowed here in Ruth as we read it. But we need to be looking for the hand of God. He's going he he's given providence. He's his presence, his provision and his protection is of the legacy of the ancestors and of the lineage through which Jesus Christ is coming. It's profound. It's profound. Now, the other thing that we want to point out here that kind of shows us that God is at work not only Ruth's faith and God's providential hand at work, but also the idea of redemption. The idea of redemption. Uh, Boaz is known as the kin, kinsman redeemer. The kinsman redeemer. And as such, he is a type of Christ. Now, I'm not saying that he is the Christ. He's a type. That means he typifies Christ in this book. The fact that he even exists in this book points us toward Christ. He's a kinsman redeemer. Now, John says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God loves all of us. Ruth, the Moabitess, the Gentile, Naomi, the Jew. He comes as a the Israelite. He comes as a kinsman redeemer to them. This allows us to be fully focused on the redemptive nature of God in the book of Ruth. So we see that though God does not speak, God is definitely a major character. So we now have four major characters. God, Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz. And some minor characters, Poloni, Almoni, Baby Obit. Limelech, Milan, and Chilean. So let us go back now and look at what the names mean. Now, for me, for a long time, I couldn't understand how the name would mean something. How they know what was going to go on in somebody's life for such a long time that they know what to name him or her when when they were born, and mostly hymns in the Bible, that would kind of tell us about his life. Then, ding, 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 the light bulb went off. Men are not writing this story. Men inspired by God are writing this story. God's plan is at work. God knows the beginning and the end. Most importantly, God knows the middle, 
between the beginning and the end. So with God knowing the, the, the beginning, the middle, and the end, God could tell you, name your child, this. Name your child, that. And so for me, then the names become just as important to know what their names mean. Okay. Especially when I'm looking at the Old Testament. Okay, especially when I'm looking at the Old Testament. Because it's pointing the way toward Christ. It's about being concealed in the Old Testament and revealed in the New Testament. So for me, names are important. So let's look at the first name, Elimelech. Elimelech. Now, we would expect if God is behind the scenes, and God is involved in intimately the naming of the person, then we would expect that their chosen Hebrew name would describe their role in the story. Their chosen Hebrew name would describe their role in the story. Okay? So even the dead have a role to play in the story. Now, let's look up Elimelech. He's the first one we hear about in the story. And he dies in the third verse. So the rest of the book is not about him. And yet, his name tells us, first of all, He's the patriarch of his family. He is the father of Milan and Killian. He is the husband of Naomi. He is the father-in-law of Orpha and Ruth. He is the patriarch or patriarch, some people may say, of his family. P-A-T-R-I-A-R-C-H. Uh, his name means my God is king. My God is king. You see how that sets us up in the story? I may be dead, but my name will live forever. Elimelech. They're going to call it. I'm still calling his name. My God is king. That's what his name means. My God is king. Now, you could look this up on the web. And you could type in the character's name and ask for the meaning. And the internet will bring you back the meaning. You could look in a good Bible encyclopedia or a good Bible uh, dictionary. You could look in a, uh, a who's who of the Bible book, and you would find his name, and next to it you would find a meaning. Okay? So, Elimelech, my God is king. Now, the next two people, before we get to Naomi, it tells us that Elimelech had two sons, okay, Milan and Chilion. Now, uh, their name is important. Milan means weakness. Weakness, W-E-A-K-N-E-S, weakness, or sickness, or sickness. Can you imagine your name being weak and sick? What do you expect the weak and the sick to do? Eventually, of course, we all have to get there some way, shape, form, or, form, or fashion. We all get to death some kind of way, but 
Here we have Milan means weakness or sickness. I'm going to pause and let that sink in to you for just a second. Chilion means annihilation or consumption. Annihilation or consumption. Now, uh, back in the day, they used to call, uh, I believe it was tuberculosis consumption. At any rate, we can gather from their name, they ain't long for the earth. They not long for the earth. Okay? So, Elimelech, my God is king, has two sons, weakness or sickness, or annihilation or consumption. These are the offspring of Naomi. Okay? Elimelech's wife. Now, widow. Uh, Naomi, if you will, can has had a hard, hard life. She's lost her husband. She's lost her children. She's fled the land in the middle of a famine, which means they weren't getting enough physical food to eat. Uh, And she decides to return to Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Now, Bethlehem, and this is just as an aside, is the house of bread. So she's going from famine to a land where she can survive. But when she decides to go back, she's going back to the house of bread. Okay? Now, Naomi means pleasant, pleasantness, P-L-E-A-S-A-N-T-N-E-S-S, pleasantness. But when she goes back to the house of bread, to Bethlehem, she goes in grief. She's lost her son. She's lost her husband. She, she. Wants to come back to something that's familiar. But she says, listen, I don't want you to call me Naomi no more. Call me Mara. Mara. M-A-R-A. Mara. Which means bitter. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I have no reason to be pleasant anymore. I'm bitter. That's going to be my new name. How many of us have adopted a name when we go through hard times? I'm depressed. I'm lonely. I'm afraid. I'm tired. I'm bitter. I'm woe out. I'm tore up from the fluid. Be careful what you name yourself. God's plan may not include that name for you. Don't wear a name that God does not intend for you to wear. God had her name as Pleasantness. Naomi. And then she says, don't call me that. Call me Bitter. Mark. You can't escape the plan of God in your life by changing your name. God's plan is God's plan is God's plan. It is what it is, right? Okay. Now, we've got Limelech, Lon, and Chilean, Naomi, and we've got someone named Orpha. Orpha. 
Now, she's one of the two daughter-in-laws, Orpha. And she's married to Chilion. Okay? Uh, Orpha begs to travel with Naomi to Bethlehem. However, once she learns how tough the journey will be, uh-uh. That's not my that's not my gig. Mm mm. Uh uh. No, 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 no. I'm not leaving all my people. I've had some second thoughts. I don't wanna go. I have changed my mind. I'm going back to what I know. I'm not I'm not up for no adventure. I'm not up to doing all this traveling by faith. I ain't there yet. I'm going back. Okay. Now, that's pretty ironic. Because her name, Orpha, means back of the neck. You can see the back of my neck because I'm going to be turning around. I'm going to be going in that direction. Y'all can go in that direction. But when y'all look around, y'all, all y'all going to see is the back of my neck. Orpha, back of the neck. That's what you see when somebody turns around and says, "Ain't go." You see their backside. In other words, you see the back of their neck. They ain't going nowhere without their head, right, attached to their body. So you're not gonna be looking at the if you if they were coming towards you, you'd see their face. But you see the back of her neck, and that's her name, Orpha, back of the neck. And then we have Ruth. Ruth, the other daughter-in-law. She's the title character. Uh, Ruth's name means friend or companion. Friend or companion. Friend or or companion. And that's what she is to Naomi. She's a loyal friend. She's a companion. But she's also loyal to God and walking with God. She is a friend and a companion of God, God's ways. God's presence. Her name means friend or companion. Now, Boaz, Boaz, his name means in him there is strength. In him there is strength. Boaz, in him there is strength. Strength for Naomi, strength for Ruth, strength to all those who depend on him, his workers. In him there is strength. He's not like the Poloni Almoni. He's not like him. He's not a so-and-so. He's not fly-by-night. He's not, you know, laissez-faire. In him, there is strength. And lastly, we get to baby Obed. Obed is the son of Ruth and Boaz. This baby is more than just the birth of a child. It's the birth of Jesus Christ. He's in the lineage of David. So we've got Jesus coming from the king, David, who is Obed begat Jesse, Jesse begat David. So he is the great 
grandson of Obed. I'm sorry. He's the grandson of Obed. The great grandson of Boaz and Ruth. Now, the name Obit means one who serves. One who serves. He's serving God's purpose. To bring the lineage of David into life. In order that the Messiah will have a line through which to come. Now, it's 11 o'clock, and therefore, we only do an hour's worth of Bible study. And all we did today was the third step of the chapter summary method. We have looked to see who are the major and the minor characters in the Bible story, the narrative in which we are reading. And we have allowed their names to put some context around Ruth. We may want to go back and read Ruth again because now we see what a major role God is playing in this whole story in the background. But it's all about God. And his name is not mentioned once. We can see that the names, the uh, my God is king. My God is king. Weakness, sickness, annihilation, consumption, pleasantness, bitter. All of these names, friend, companion, so and so, and Obit. Obit. The name Obit, one who serves. Jesus came to serve. What a great legacy God is pointing to us or pointing out to us. He's coming from a line of those who serve. Let us pray. Father God, what an eye-opening Bible study we had today. I learned so much about you and who you are, how you are at work in my life, even though I may not see you. What a great reminder. That even though you may not seem to be there, you always are. That you are a keeper of your promises. That you cannot lie. And you have promised never to leave us nor forsake us. So that no matter what we're going through or how we're going through it, you are still there with us. When we are traveling the valleys, you are there. When we're climbing up the mountain, you are there. When we are on the mountaintop, having the time of our life, you are even there. And Father God, I just want to thank you. I just want to thank you. And Father God, as I, as I, as, as I and us and we study the book of Ruth, give us more insights as to how we can apply it to our lives and share it with someone else. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Remember, God really does love you, and so do I. I'll see you next week, God willing. Amen. And praise God.